Welcome to FYI, the four-year innovation podcast. This show offers an intellectual discussion on technologically enabled disruption, because investing in innovation starts with understanding it. To learn more, visit arc-invest.com. Arc Invest is a registered investment advisor focused on investing in disruptive innovation. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. It does not constitute either explicitly or implicitly any provision of services or products by ARC. All statements made regarding companies or securities are strictly beliefs and points of view held by ARC or podcast guests and are not endorsements or recommendations by ARC to buy, sell, or hold any security. Clients of ARC Investment Management may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. Hello. Welcome to FYI, the For Your Innovation podcast. My name is Brett Winton. I'm the Chief Futurist at ARK Invest. Today, I have the pleasure of having Eric Balchunas on the pod. Eric, hi. How are you? Hi, Brett. Great to be here. Eric's a senior ETF analyst at Bloomberg Intelligence. He's also the author of a really enjoyable and I found fascinating book, uh, The Bogle Effect, How John Bogle and Vanguard Turned Wall Street Inside Out and Saved Investors Trillions. So first of all, Note of order. I thought his name was Jack Bogle. <laughs> it is. Oh, it, okay. you mean John? <laughs> yes, in the title, no, no. it's John Bogle. Yes, that, that formal. Obviously, a lot of people named John went by Jack, like JFK. That was a thing. Yeah, so he was technically John, but people called him Jack. It seemed like you knew him well enough to refer to him as Jack. I only did that because it's the title. You know, it's a formal title, and I wanted to be a little more formal there, but I. Inside the book, there's plenty of jacks. Yes. The reason I'm having you on, the reason I'm, I really enjoyed this book is because I think this book is actually, it's, yes, it's a, it's a book about Jack Bogle, but it's really a book about innovation and the innovation that Jack brought to the financial industry. And so the way I think about the innovations, there's like indexation as an innovation, and then there's a separate set of innovations around the ETFs that have built on top of indexation. Maybe you can start with with indexing and how Jack brought indexing to Wall Street and what that even means. Yeah, I mean, uh, for a while there, you know, 50 years ago, people were like, are active managers really worth it? You know, there was this sort of debate coming out. And at the time, Bogle was an active manager, but he got in, long story short, he partnered with some people in the 60s. The 70 crash came and he had a falling out with his partners and the way they came to a compromise is the Bogle said, hey, I'll, I'll do the back office for you guys and you run the money. And so that's what happened. And Bogle being a very ambitious guy, when they set up, when he set up Vanguard as a back office company, he read an article about indexing. And he thought, you know, this is a pretty good idea and we can't run money, but maybe we could put out an index fund and we're not technically managing money. So we'd be a good shop to do that. And so that's kind of how the idea was birthed right there. But the idea had been around acad- academia and uh, Wells Fargo had started to try when there was, I equate indexing in the 60s to like PCs in maybe the, the 80s or 70s where there, there's something in there. You know, Steve Jobs wasn't the only guy working in a, in a garage on computers. He happened to be the guy that really democratized it and got it to the masses. And I think Bogle's a similar way that didn't invent it, but he was able to get to the masses. And the key thing that I go out in the book, it's not just indexing that he is that's important. It's cheap indexing. <laughs> so an index fund at 100 basis points makes no sense. But what Bogle did is set up Vanguard as a mutually owned company, which means that the funds own the company and the investors own the funds. So whenever they got assets, they would all vote on what to do with the profits. Of course, they're like, well, let's just make the funds cheaper because that's going to help us. That's honestly the main nucleus of the whole thing. Because when they first put out index funds in 1975, I think it was 45 or 40, 44 basis points was the fee. But the structure kept lowering the fee over the next 40 years. So it wasn't really until the 2000s when the fee got to about 15 basis points that it really started to become an L curve. So he actually was out there talking about indexing and why it was good for a long time. It took a long time for this idea to take root. But 
you know, again, the idea is just generally you buy all the stocks market cap weighted. And the reason it's it's sweeping the nation though is because it's it's cheap. People like the idea of owning, you know, 90, 99 to 95% of the US market cap for no fee. They feel like there's no friction there. I get to keep all the returns that come out of it. And it makes sense. I mean, that's a logical, a high value proposition that he offered, but it certainly wasn't like overnight. This thing took a long time. And the key though, again, is the mutual ownership structure of Vanguard, which no one has copied, which is very, part of the reason I wrote the book is like, how come nobody's copied this? And there's really no economic incentive to set up a company where you turn over all the profits to the customers. So I was fascinated. Why, why did he do it? You know, if, you know, most people go to Wall Street, they want to make money, not give it to the people. So I found that part of the story really interesting. And that's an underrated part. I feel like Bogle and the mutual ownership structure are paramount to how big indexing has become today. Well, because like the idea of indexing, like the way I think about indexing is this is simply like you're defining a strict set of rules and that's the mechanism by which you invest. And because the rules are effectively written down beforehand, and we can get into implementation issues, it's very inexpensive to prosecute those rules. So you don't have to, you don't have to charge a high fee to prosecute the rules. In the, call it 80s and, and 90s, there were so many high other fees attached to mutual funds on the distribution side that um, kind of there wasn't the same incentive to figure out well, what's a really inexpensive way to manage the money. And so there's been a compression and kind of the distribution fee take rate, which then also means that if you can manage the money itself in an extremely inexpensive way, which again, is if it's like, I'm going to only buy companies that have C in their name, and there probably is an ETF that has that as its, as its theme, um, you know, it would be really inexpensive. You just look at, like, it's very easy to search a list of companies for C and be like, okay, I'm buying all of them, and I'm going to market cap weight them. Uh, and so you don't need to hire smart people to do that, or really any people to do that, you can run that programmatically. And so then that allows it to be very ex- inexpensive. Yeah, um, that's part of it. I think you don't need a bunch of, you don't need a big research staff because you're just, I mean, let's face it, index funds ride the coattails of active. Active is like in a circle and they're all betting against each other and they're determining the prices. The prices determine the market cap and the index fund just says, okay, you guys determine this is what this is all worth. We'll just weight them by market cap. Obviously, Amazon, Apple bid up by active is now the biggest stocks in the country. So you're essentially just sort of riding actives negotiation process, but without the fees. And this is an important concept because post fee, most active managers will underperform, especially over long periods of time. And so a lot of people over the eighties and nineties, at first they thought, oh, indexing sounds average. I'd rather somebody win and not just lock in average, but over 10, 20 years, it ends up that your index fund will probably be in the top 10% of all mutual funds. So you're sort of locking in a very good performance if you can hold it long enough. And I think that's a, that's a powerful concept for people, especially if you're long-term buy and hold. And that really resonated with everybody. But again, that doesn't work if the index fund charges 85 to 100 basis points. It really only works if it's basically free. And that, to me, was the innovation. Because when you talked about the, the way indexes are made, they're basically pretty McDonald's simple, I'll, I'll, I agree. But there are tweaks. Like the S&P 500 has a rule in there that you have to have four quarters of positive earnings, which is why Tesla wasn't in for a long time. Tesla took t- 10 years for Tesla to get in. And then the, there's a committee on top of that that has discretionary power where they actually held Tesla back for an extra like few months so the S&P, honestly, is pretty active. I mean, they, they'll, they recently kicked out Macy's. They added Tesla. It's a living, breathing organism. It's not like static. But largely speaking, compared to a discretionary manager doing a bunch of trades, it's pretty static and McDonald's simple. But the key to it is, again, that it's you can get it for 0.03%. That's what gives it its power, in my opinion. Yeah. I mean, the irony there, I, there's a few things I want to unpick. I think the, the irony is, is, like you say, like, an index is a very, you know, strict set of rules, yet with lots of discretion. And how, like the indexes that get constructed, like my fictional companies that begin with the letter C index, that itself is kind of like an active decision of whether or not this is an interesting 
representative set of companies to invest in. And then the other side of it is, and I think the Tesla example is interesting, um, is that particularly cap, a cap weighted index necessarily it like relies upon the active management portion to kind of determine weight in index. And so as indexation takes up a larger share of assets as a whole, doesn't that introduce then essentially more inefficiency that's exploitable by active managers conceptually uh, and potentially more volatility in markets generally? Yeah. So a uh, couple, let me pick that apart here. Your cat example, by the way, I'm sure that will be an ETF someday or the things that begin with the letter C. Maybe because of this podcast, maybe. Uh. <laughs> maybe. Listen, <laughs> they're throwing everything out there. Uh, who knows? I agree with you. There are so many ETFs that are active. I mean, thematic ETFs are active. There are smart beta ETFs that are active. They just weight the stocks by dividends. Well, even though it's a rules-based system, it's still active because it's deviating from the quote market. So I, you have a great, good point there. The concept of how big it can get. So right now, I would say true beta index funds, not your cat example, but the ones that are more like Russell 1000, S&P 500, those are probably accounting for, I don't know, they probably own 13% of all stocks. Institutions probably have some passive exposure through SMA. So I don't know the five, ten percent. So let's say about a quarter. Uh, see, this this is in your book, but I I take a little issue. Do you think with it's this, larger? Just as someone, I, I said, well, it's not that the pure beta ones are larger. It's just the behavior of managers is guided by those indexes to a very high degree. Oh, as you're saying, yeah. So cl- if you count closet indexing, active managers, yeah, yeah. yeah. You have a good point because there's like 11 trillion benchmarked to the S&P. So you start, if you want to get that liberal with it, which I'm fine to do that, yeah, you might be looking more at like, I don't know, maybe 35, 40%. Because if you look at the ownership of the stock market, 40% is owned by households. So they just own the stocks directly. You've got institutions in there, foreign investors, businesses like corporations that own some stocks. And then you have mutual funds and ETFs. So it is a big pie, bigger than people think. Like funds only really own about 35, 40% of stocks. And so sometimes we get caught in the fund slice of things. So even if like a passive took over all funds, right now passive makes up about 40% of all fund assets. Even if it went to 100, you're still only talking about something that owns 40% of the stock market. So I do think there, even with that scenario, there's still going to be plenty of active management setting prices. The other thing with your volatility, I think that's where you have a good point. I think the more passive grows and passive investors tend to never trade, like they're very disciplined, which I think is probably a good thing. It's good not to, you know, trade on your emotions. If they don't trade, it will create probably more volatility in the stocks that do, because there'll just be less people trading and the the, the price could move a little, a little more volatile. Is that good or bad? I don't know. I mean, I think at the end of the day, we've seen earnings come out. This is what I watch to see if there's any problems. Let's say GE has bad earnings. That stock will go down. Now, over the next couple months, let's say GE goes down 35% over, I don't know, a year because it had the awful earnings and people just don't like the stock. Actives like I'm over this. So it goes on 35%. Yet passive funds that own it are taking in money. Okay, maybe it would have gone down 38% if it wasn't for the passive flows. But GE is still going to move based on how the active managers interpret its fundamentals, the sentiment. And again, this seems to happen time and time, uh, especially on earnings. You, you look, there's always a, a, if the earnings are a surprise, you will see the stock move. There's, it's not like it passive has dulled everything. I think to your point though, the more, it ta- the more it gets bigger, you probably will see increased vol because of the fact that less people are active. You just like casually dismiss this huge percentage of households that directly own stocks and said, well, we're going to like subselect a fund management industry. If it's just like passive takes over the whole fund management industry, well, yep. then like price discovery is left to the individuals. And, and so like you said, uh, stocks you know, go down on bad earnings. What about like a stock declaring bankruptcy? Should that go down or up? Because we have a relatively recent example in Hertz where it declared bankruptcy and actually, you know, the... Certainly, the price movement was not predictable from from this person's perspective. You, well, you're talking about the the meme stock crowd. That's a whole different animal, but but it's related. Like if you imagine if you imagine that the pricing control and discovery is shifting on the one hand on the fund management side more into 
funds that are being hyper aggressive. They're incentivizing their employees on a you know on yearly basis to aggressively pursue like kind of like let's you know maximize return using long short strategies and and all kinds of options. And then on the other side, you have people who are um, in part some large portion of them, you know, playing kind of a casino game or, or flipping between, uh, you know, various cryptocurrencies and, and, and meme stocks um, in part for the lulls and in part, like, you know, some of them like very thesis driven, um, then I think you can result in like more manic swings in, sure. in price performance, right? Yeah, I don't totally disagree with that. And I think that's part of why the hijack potential of a stock goes up the more there's passive. I, I, I don't disagree. I just think over long periods of time, I think fundamentals probably will rule out. And I think that the idea of owning, say, you know, the 500 largest stocks with some certain filters at a low fee, I just have no problem with that growing. Uh, I think it's generally good for people. I think if you're also an active manager, it probably does present some opportunities. So what we think is that what's going to happen is active will just get more active, which is probably good because you just described a whole industry of closet indexers that charge 80 basis points. What's the point of that? I think that's ultimately part of what Bogle did was the active mutual fund industry over the 80s and 90s, they got huge. And they largely benchmarked to the index because they didn't want to have any big underperformance because they didn't want to lose those big assets. But their dollar fees were insane. They, you know, you make 1% on $100 million, right? That's a million dollars a year. Okay, you need that to pay people and keep the lights on, but you have 100 billion. Now you have a billion dollars just from that one fund. They didn't really share that. I think they could have lowered the fees over the years, gotten lower, their beat rates would have gone up, and they would have avoided the Vanguard effect. But Bogle obviously kept lowering the fees, right? Sharing those economies of scale. And so when people started caring about cost in like the 2000s, all of a sudden you've got active over here at 80 giving you basically S&P stocks. And you've got Bogle down here giving you the same stocks basically for like five basis points it's a no-brainer. That's when it went gradually and then suddenly. So it's hard to, I guess, when we talk about passive fears and like how big can it get, sometimes it's difficult to go fully into it academically because of the, it's such a good deal. And I think some people uh, have to uh, just accept that this was a business capitalist outcome. This is you guys, well, I'll say some managers <laughs> study disruption and innovation this is a classic case of disruption. Almost reminds me a bit of Uber and taxis or what the MP3 did to the music industry. So Active, I think, is going to have to do two things. I think one is get cheaper and the other is get more active. And honestly, I got to think an active manager is going to be more happy going with their 30 best picks than basically whether to you wake up and decide whether they have 3% of Amazon that day or 3.2%. I think that's ultimately we'll find a barbelling of assets from like dirt cheap beta and then truly high active share active, which will complement said beta. And I think that's the world we're going to live in for a while. Yeah. I mean, that makes sense to me. One note on kind of the S&P 500, I thought the Tesla example is an interesting one because, you know, from our perspective, we think that there are, you know, this is a unique time in technological economic history. And there's this going to be this huge explosion of business value creation tied to the technologies that we focus on. And um, within that context, for many companies, optimal strategy will not be to become profitable. Like as in, you want to keep enough cash to reinvest in the business, but, but you don't want to accrue cash on your balance sheet unless it just, you know, if you have no other place in which to put it and, and because the technology platform and footprints are going to become so valuable that you just want to maximize that footprint. And with, with a set of conditions imposed by the S&P uh, 500, it may keep those companies outside of benchmarks longer. Just like just like companies have stayed private longer, um, you know, they, they stay private longer because they don't want to deal with the noise and, you know, pain of going through an IPO process and getting into the public markets could be even companies that have come public will continue to restrain kind of actual cash or maybe not cash flow generation, but actual profitability and try to push that off. And so then the net entrant into the S&P 500 becomes a much bigger 
company, just like Tesla was. And so then somebody who is sitting in the S&P 500 in an index fund says, oh, I'm great. You know, I have the index. I have the index. This is what I'm supposed to do. And yet they miss out on the, the appreciation to the most technologically interesting opportunities that are being held out because they're not seeking to optimize against indexation rules. Instead, they're, you know, optimizing against the strategic, like, cash flow opportunity they have ahead of them. Absolutely. And I think two things on that. One, this is where a Bogle, what he would probably advise, he, he loved, his first fund was the S&P Vanguard 500. But over time, he evolved the total market fund. He really stressed buying the total market, which have had, has had Tesla in it for 10 years. Now, it was still a tiny weight. You didn't feel a lot of Tesla until it got a little bigger. But to your point, I think this is why Active will have a role. I think going out and sniffing out these companies is a perfect role for Active. That's sort of what you want from them. I think what, again, the idea of whether to weight Amazon 3% or 2% is not really worth the money for a lot of people. But what they do want is maybe, hey, go find these new opportunities, bring them to me. I think that's why uh, the flows in small caps tend to be a little less violent in terms of coming out than they are in large caps. So I think places where there's less analyst coverage, places where uh, there's little overlap with the S&P, I think you will find that because you're right, the S&P and and mainstream indexes in general, this would go for the total market, MSCI, they got a lot of rules. This is why we, we actually are fans on our team of the, um, there's an ETF that tracks IPOs. That's an interesting fund. It's uh, FPX, the ticker, IPO is another one. But those funds track the IPO from day for like four or five to either year two or year four, depending on, they have different rules. But they outperform the S&P pretty well. And it only takes a couple juggernaut winners to overcome and offset all the dogs that they have. And Tesla was one example. Facebook was another. And so I agree with you. On our team, what we're trying to do is find ETFs that have bring a value to the table outside of mostly beta. And so I, I agree with you. I think that's, honestly, again, I think that's part of where active managers are moving. And I think they'd have more fun doing that, trying to find something that's going to uh, pay off later that wasn't simply already in everybody's index. Uh, I think that's that makes a lot of sense. But yeah, you're right. It took Tesla 10 years to get into the S&P, which is, uh, you, you probably, you could argue that's just too long for a company like that, but that's just, those are the strict rules these indexes have. Well, I, along those 10 years, I don't know. We, I think there, there, is, there is also, it's interesting to me, particularly, I think large cap managers and large cap funds are condition, congenitally conservative. Like they're, they're very small C conservative about kind of like what, they invest in because they, you don't, if you have a mutual fund, you do. Yeah. What you're describing is career risk. Career risk is a very underrated phrase. It works for advisors and active managers. They work to in lockstep. If you're the core of a portfolio, like many of these active funds were in the eighties and nineties, people put like the fidelity fund in their core. So that, that manager can't go crazy. I mean, they can't really color outside the lines too much because the advisor that they're selling that to or the 401k plan, that person isn't going to tolerate a lot of underperformance. And if you are going out after some big bets and you're more concentrated, you are going to have periods of underperformance and volatility that is going to make it tough for the advisor to have a conversation with their clients. So advisors tend to be uh, risk averse. That's why these large cap managers are unfortunately now locked into like the worst of both worlds. They're now getting kicked out of the core of portfolios but they still have to act like they're in the core. And so they can't really do much. So what you do find some of them doing, which I think is smart, is re, like launching an ETF group inside their bigger fund company that does some different things rather than trying to sell closet indexing high-cost active to the masses. We've seen some come over and try to do that in ETFs, and no, nobody cares. So what you're describing, I think career risk is probably the variable that is underrated <laughs> And we see this all the time in the flows. We, we see a lot of money going into like the Vanguard value fund or the uh, Russell 1000 growth. And it's very watered down. It's not really doing much, but it's five basis points and it won't move that much. And, and for many advisors, they will tend to go for the least risky, cheap choice. So you do find a lot of money preferring that. But the problem with that is you go growth manager who or a value manager that used to charge 90 basis points. Now you can get 
the S and P 500 value, the you know the 250 that are on the value side of it for five. So smart beta has also made life very difficult for the the closet indexing active manager. So basically, alpha and active keep get turning into cheap beta. So what we try to tell people and and is to go where the indexes aren't. Everything gets turned into commoditized, and so this industry, like any other, you can see. The ETF in particular, that's where a lot of the innovation, you've seen this list of single security ETFs, single bond ETFs, YouTubers. These are all people trying to do something away from the index because going and trying to charge you know, 10 times for what you can get in an index fund uh, for almost free, uh, it's basically a, like a suicide mission at this point. It's, and you can see why. I mean, who would pay 10 times more for anything in their life when it basically gets the same thing? And likely it probably will underperform over time. Yeah. Let's talk about ETFs for a moment. That's, I think, another innovation kind of embedded in in Jack Bogle's story. And he was against ETFs when, yeah, why? What's wrong with ETFs? Or actually, actually, before you get there, let me introduce like how I think about financial innovation. And you can say, does indexation and does do ETFs fit into this? But the, I think... Financial innovation, it's, it's actually hard to measure, but often the characteristic it takes on is that an end customer, a retail customer, gets pricing for a product that was previously only available to wholesale customers. So you can think of mortgage securitization of, as being like that, where you know, if I had to you know, go out and borrow directly from a bank as an individual Prior to mortgage securitization, I had to pay basically double the interest rate of, of what uh, a corporate would pay for a similarly risked um, kind of fixed income instrument. And so by cramming all of the mortgages together, you can build them big enough that you can sell them as fixed income instruments. And so then it claps the cost of borrowing for the individual. And so indexation in some ways, is, it's kind of like that where you know a very big company could have gotten broad exposure to all of the the equities um, just by dint of their size. Like they could actually buy all of the individual equities, but an individual couldn't until the index fund came out. And then is there an analogy with ETFs as well? I don't know, but what is the innovation of ETFs? I think what you're getting at is uh, this democratization. Like ETF democratized investing in two ways, in my opinion. First, they serve up everything under the sun I mean, and they still are. They're going to throw everything at you to see what sticks and what doesn't. And they standardize it. So now you get U.S. equities and you can trade them just like, like you, or you can get a bond ETF. It trades like an equity. Everybody loves the way equities trades. This is the number one trading of all the asset classes. It's better than commodities. It's just, it rules, price transparency. So ETFs in many, in many ways have made everything trade like an equity. That's, that's huge. And there's no share classes in mutual funds over the years. It's like a, uh, what do you call that? Regressive tax. The more money you have, the less they charge you. So if you're an institution, you get charged the least. Retail gets charged the most. It's kind of sucks. ETFs give everybody the institutional class. So they have democratized investing in two ways. And so I like, I used to have this presentation where I would go over some fun facts on ETFs. And one of them was my mom and the world's largest hedge fund are in the same ETF, which was VWO. Ray Dalio at Bridgewater owns VWO and so does my mom. So I find that, and they both pay the, pay the same fee. And that's, that's kind of cool. And they both benefit from each other in that the more retail is in there, the more the institutions get the liquidity because they love liquidity and they love cheap spreads. So they kind of first time in, in ever that everybody's playing in the same sandbox. And I think that's kind of works. They get to feed off each other and it works well uh, because they benefit, they're kind of benefit from each other. So I think that's kind of what you're getting at. And ETFs, Bogle did not like them simply because they trade. He just was anti-trading. He didn't like trading. And that was his number one thing. And then over the years, he got um, tired of the marketing. He thought there was too many weird stuff putting out there. And he felt like Dr. Frankenstein, like he had created this index fund. and Everybody was uh, doing new innovations on it. And you have to understand, though, Bogle was so pure in that he thought you just buy a total market index fund, wait 50 years, Everything else is distraction. It was interesting because he launched the first value index fund. He launched the first growth index fund. He launched the quant fund in the 80s. He launched international. And he would come to just basically crap on all of it, even though these were his funds. And that caused a rift with him and Vanguard because he'd be, after he stepped out as CEO, he'd be on campus saying, you don't need ETFs. They suck. International sucks. 
Meanwhile, the company's trying, they have like salespeople and like people, you know, who are in charge of all these products. And so I found that kind of interesting also in that Bogle spoke his mind completely, even when it was, compl- you know, may cause rift with his own company. But I also tell people, not everybody is like him. You know, not everybody's pure. Some people like to try to do better. Some people like international. Uh, some people think ETFs are fine. I talked to advisors who said, I'm not really tempted to trade. I'm okay being in an ETF. But Bogle also said no to ETFs when he was running Vanguard, and they Vanguard launched ETFs 10 years later, kind of in his face. So there was also some personal emotional baggage potentially about Vanguard sort of overturning what he did. And then now ETFs are the fastest growing area of Vanguard, and ETFs have now passed index mutual funds in assets. So like ETFs are now king of passive, and that, that did bother him for, for his years. He would admit if you bought a broad market-based ETF and you, and you held it, he, he was fine with that. But then he would never just leave it there. His point was like, uh, you know, buying an, in, buying, an, buying an instrument that then you can see the price of is a bad instrument because then you might sell it or you might try, you might get tempted into trading it. Was that like what, and not only that, he also said, look, and these things trade all the time. So they're clearly incentivizing trading, right? Yeah. I mean, his, his famous phrase was, he said, it's like handing an arsonist the match. He just, <laughs> and so he had no, I guess he had, he had no faith in people to just not trade. So, I mean, if, if you're the kind of person who is tempted to trade and, you know, maybe you are better at an index mutual fund if your goal is to build wealth over 50 years. But I think there's most people who already have that goal. I want to build wealth in the long term. They buy the ETF. They're just not the kind of person tempted to trade. Plus, you can get out of a mutual fund every day. It's not like the, the mutual fund locks your money in. It's just daily. But the, the idea that he, was a, he had thought stocks started trading too much anyway. So ETFs come along and they want to take his – I got my analogy in the book is the index mutual fund's like his firstborn daughter. And the ETFs like the tatted up bad boy who want, who she's in love with and they get married. And now he has to deal with this guy. And he just was like, why I had, this was perfect. And he struggled with that for, you know, 20, 25 years. And he would write op-eds in like the FT and the wall street journal bashing ETFs and Vanguard is out there trying to like build the whole, the, the ETF business. And uh, you know, in, the first time I ever interviewed him, I walked in the office and he was talking about how he'd gotten all this crap from the management there because he wrote this FT piece. And I was just like, what? I did, was not expecting that. And I was like, this guy is different. I mean, this, what's going on over here? And that was just like, seemed like a dysfunctional kind of family. It seems like there's an analogy with indexation where like indexes only work because active does price discovery. Well, it's kind of like the ETFs as an instrument for somebody or even the superiority. So you name like, the fee is the same across all holders of an ETF. And ETFs do provide like a better liquidity instrument for the underlying holdings and for the exposures for individuals than do mutual funds. Like you can look and you talk about it in the book, but at the um, kind of fixed income ETFs and how, or, or I, the, I think it was in the book where the Egyptian equity market shut down, but the ETF tracking the equity market kept trading. Yes. And that happens every day with Japan. There's a Japan ETF. It's never trading the same time as the Japan stocks. And so sometimes there, there's a market that just is done for like uh, the Russia ETF traded a little bit after Russia shut down. Um, we've seen it happen here and there. And with bonds, it's the same premise because not all the like HYG is the most popular junk bond ETF. And not all the I think half the bonds trade in a, in a day on average. Half of them just don't even trade. Yet the HYG sees like two billion dollars of trading so and that's okay i'm not i'm not worried about that look no no i'm not i'm not worried i think it's i think it's actually um it's an innovation that's useful because as as someone who is imagine i'm a holder of this stuff and then suddenly my life falls apart and i go from an investor to somebody that needs to um kind of actually access those assets so the liquidity provides the option value of the person who's even a long-term holder to exit without penalty, right? Yes, but the only thing I would warrant there is one time when there was a sell-off like 10 years ago, BlackRock said ETFs are the true market. I thought that went a little too far. I think ETFs are the true market plus the take the market makers need to make this worth it, which is the arbitrage. So there's an arbitrage ban. I won't get into details, but I would say in a really rough crisis mode, you might pay 20 to 50 basis points to get out. 
that and but most people honestly would be like given i really need the money i'd i'd rather pay those that little bit of exit fee and no and and get out cuz you can get out rather than hold all these bonds and go out and try to sell them when nobody wants to buy them so it's not like the etf avoids this stuff i think it's just pretty efficient and it's become such a thing that all of the biggest market makers use and work around that it it actually does help help people who do want that liquidity on bad days that said if you can hold on and not sell on bad days i think you're better off like if i was holding hyg i probably wouldn't sell on the worst day ever cuz you are the market makers are not in a charity they they're, they're going to they're going to give you a price but they need to make sure they're covered and um they are able to arbitrage the bonds correctly so you're going to get a price that's somewhat you know in line with the underlying basket which if nobody wants to buy it that price is going to reflect that sure but the ability to, like, if you go back to even uh, even the global financial crisis, um, you know, the equity markets did great relative to every other market, right? Because they were liquid. There was like you, if you create a market with a lot of liquidity, that provides like a mechanism for price discovery, even even in kind of extreme circumstances. And what you're saying, which I I agree with, is like you want. You want your buy or sell decision to be something that is triggered by something independent of the market. It's like the the behavioral psych mistakes people make is when they're buying and selling based on kind of what the market's doing rather than something, you know, that either a plan that they've set up or rules in their life or needs in their life that are happening independent of that, right? Yeah, and one thing that, you know, ETFs were came out of the 1987 crash where people were using futures as quote, quote portfolio insurance. And what the guys who made the ETF really thought of was let's let's make futures, but have them physically backed. And I think that's something people miss and why an ETF, because it is a derivative, but it isn't. It's a literally structured as a mutual fund. So when HYG gets a bunch of inflows, somebody has to go make new shares. And what they do is they hand in those junk bonds and then it's held with a custodian. So if you own HYG, you own a receipt. That's why Spider is called S&P depository receipt. You own a receipt for those bonds. And I personally have found more confidence in backing ETFs because of that. I like that they're physically backed. Whereas if you're depending on a counterparty, we know that's, that can be problematic. Uh, so I like that a custodian holds these because the first ETF was invented by Nate Most, who used to run the commodities exchange. And the commodities, uh, um, the commodities exchange was linked to a warehouse. And in the warehouse, you would take in a bunch of soybean oil because you don't want to trade that. So you would put it in the locker. They give you a receipt. And then you can just trade your receipts. So you have to move merchandise back and forth. You get a bunch of receipts. You want a bunch of soy. You just go to the locker and they give you a bunch of soybean oil. So he just took that paradigm. And instead of soybean oil, it was S&P 500 stocks. And so that's why I try to tell people Spider is depository receipt, which again, I think it gives it that next level of product durability that, that a derivative doesn't have, in my opinion. Right. That makes sense. Um, so speaking of trading, which Bogo was not a fan of, um, could you talk about you're a member of the media? It seems as if like the the media information environment, and, and I think he expressed, at least in your book, there was a section of him expressing concern about this as well, actually um, biases towards called action and turmoil and, and, and really like feeds into people's kind of behavioral psychology weaknesses. Oh yeah. Fear and FOMO. That's what, that's largely what the media is going to go for. Like it just gets clicks. I mean, you put a nasty picture of a nasty bear on the cover worst since 2008, you know, it's just going to, I've, I've seen it. I've published stuff and I've tweeted about stuff and I've done stuff. That's a little more dramatic, gets a lot of engagement, a lot of reads. If you put something out here, like everything's fine or like you zoom out and you show somebody, well, 10 years, you're good. It, nobody clicks on that. And so the media's motives are not really to help investors. And it, you got to understand that. And so I think that's part of why, why Bogle had some problems with the media as well. Throw in free trading, and that's where you get, I think, an explosion of bad behavior and things like the meme stock uh, boom uh, from two years ago. But yeah, there's a lot of things working against the investor behavior and also just the price going down. Sometimes it's hard to behave if if it's not working out for you. So I, I actually think just providing the market with a low-cost index fund helped behavior tremendously. I think Bogle's unaccredited 
in psychology and behavior studies because I do believe that there's a resignation that comes across people who have a three basis point market, total market ETF or index fund because they're like, you know, well, what am I going to do? Am I going to jump out of this, go to like some manager who happens to be doing well? Nah, I'm fine. This is a good deal. And, you know, I can never underperform because I am the market. Now, I'm not going to say, does that mean that's the best investment? I'm just sort of putting you in the mindset because when you look at Vanguard flows and passive flows, they are durable. They really, they come in rain or shine. This year, passive is going to take in about 400 billion. Active seen outflows of 560 billion. So what we're going to see over the next couple sell-offs is actually passive is going to grow quicker um, than active. But the active I'm talking about seeing outflows is that closet indexing high cost active. So I try to tell people, if money goes out of there and, and into passive, all that's happening is you're still owning Amazon, Apple, JP Morgan. They're just owning it for way cheaper. So they're going from closet indexing to actual indexing. So when you see that money move, it's actually still the same ownership of stocks. It's nothing really crazy going on. So that's why if you see an equal amount coming out of passive into active or vice versa, it's not that big. Of, it's like a wash. Do you think that media incentive structure around particularly markets, do you think it's gotten worse over time? I don't know. It's kind of always been like this. I think um, it's always been. Have you always been on Twitter? I don't know if it's always been like this. Well, Twitter, Twitter's almost its own thing. The media and Twitter are, are they're the same but different. I think Twitter, the reason you have, uh, Twitter can get very dark and nasty because there's anonymous people. At least the media, there's a byline and a person and their face is there. Once you get anonymous, you really get some some crazy, uh, and you know, you get it, it opens up Pandora's box. The media, I will say, probably a little less crazy that way. I think though the media will definitely cover things more in short-term focuses. I think they're gonna, if they see something go down this month, they're gonna hone in on that month to show the line going down. Even if you zoomed out, it's not that bad. You know, I try to when I'm on the media and I I, so I say I'm a zoomer outer. I like to zoom out and see perspective. And the problem is, you know, again, you're talking about clicks, eyeballs, engagements. Look, I've I've said if you put junk bond ETF on Twitter, if you put junk bond ETF, sees a two billion dollar largest inflow in two years, you might get two likes. But junk bond ETF sees largest outflow in two years, you're gonna get like, you know, five retweets, ten like ten likes, or whatever the proportion is, you're gonna get like twenty times the engagement. Is that new or has that always been there and it just gets amplified more because of Twitter? No. I think it's amplified more on Twitter. I think as uh, someone I work with said, the bears like to get fed. You know, people, <laughs> there's just a group of people who are very interested in bad news. Uh, it's more shocking. I also think that warning people talking about how things are going go to to go to shit sounds smart somehow. It almost sounds more sophisticated to call out all these bubbles and all this stuff, you almost sound like you're um, concerned and you're care and you're sophisticated. By saying like things are going to work out, it almost sounds more naive. And yet, if your goal is to build wealth, you really should be on, on that side. It's been proven over and over. So also what's, what's ironic is that you know, a lot of people, if you really look at what they're holding, they're probably buy and hold investors. But there's just this media apparatus that is going to just chase the ball around the field. I would say that the same thing uh, exists in other uh, areas like politics. They're going to go for the worst story. They're never going to go by like, oh, this cool little bill got passed. It's gonna, they're not going to cover that. So I think it exists everywhere. You know, there's that famous phrase, phrase if, it le- if it bleeds, it leads. It's just... <laughs> so but funny. here it's like particularly if our, you know, under the assumption that markets are going to continue to compound it, something resembling the previous rate, like a, a media cycle that you know, it's not just over trading, but but that that pushes people out of that that causes people to think they can go cash out of cash, cash out of cash in an efficient way um, is probably even more disastrous than what Vogel was concerned about. I would say, though, and I try to show this in the book, a lot of people are onto this. There is a group of advisors. I call them the big long, you know, the big short. They saw this bubble coming. And that's been so glamorized. Everybody wants to be the new big short guy. But the money has been made by the big long advisors. And now I, I've seen them. They're usually buy and hold Vanguard Schwab investors. They actually will mock the media. And, and they, they, they'll write about how this 
this, the headlines are crazy. They'll write about behavior. And I think that actually is shifting the actual beha- behavior itself. I get a cheap index fund, I think, has gone a long way, but so has a lot of the, uh, what would Gladwell call them, the connectors, the people who write about this stuff, the advisors who are uh, pretty prominent. Because if you look at the flows, there, there really isn't much selling going on outside of the, v- the trading vehicles, like the TQQQs, which are generally people who are gambling and speculating. But the, the meat of the passive funds, they see inflows during these bear markets, which shows you that the, the media isn't really having an effect on them. Uh, I think, A, because they've, they've seen this before, because I think if you're older, you probably had an experience once in your life where you bought high and sold low. And then you realize, wait a second, if I do that, am I going to do that again? And so I think, you know, once bitten, twice shy, and just having a cheap index fund allowing you to resign to it's just the best deal you're going to get, don't mess with it. I think those two things have gone a long way to fighting that because I've seen uh, some days, especially pre-Fed inflation fight back in like 2020, uh, 2018, 2017, the headlines were so bad. Everybody's like, oh, the market's definitely going down. And it you know, it just didn't, you know, people were like, no, it's pretty good. I'm going to go, I'm going to just keep buying. And it would go up pretty quickly after the flows never fought. So there was a definitely a gap between the news flow and the flows. I don't know why it's not closer, but that's just the way it is. But now, I mean, so you talked about that, like the single stock ETFs, right? So it's like providing people with, with mechanisms by which they can very easily buy a probably on the back end, expensive mechanism by which to short Tesla, say, or short, you know, whatever single stock. It, it, so it, like leaving aside the kind of passive index side of the market within the part of the market that is people call it, call it trading. I call them trading tools. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it, it feeds directly into that or those are very. Oh, simple. sure. Oh, yeah. But th- that's what they want to do. Um, th- they're not. There's two behaviors, two different things. If you go into the market and you're going for what my friend calls ROE, return on entertainment, then that's exactly what you want. You want to trade. You want the news to be crazy. What I'm saying is the typical buy and hold investors who would, their goal is to build wealth, they're becoming way more immune to meet to news flow. They're just not biting on the headlines like they used to. The traders, I think they're the ones who actually like that. I think that they, they're looking for volatility and the single stock ETFs, as crazy as they seem, I do think there's a market for them. And as I said, they're in a VFC, a Vanguard free zone. You could actually be the kind of person with both of those people in one brain. You could have 70% in a cheap beta index fund <clears throat> that you don't touch because you've been there and you're fine. And you could actually go nuts with the 20%. You could trade call options. You could do this in some people. It might be a behavioral hack to just keep themselves occupied, scratch an itch so they don't touch the 70%, which does take time and you know, you, you really want to capture the uh, magic of compounding and you can't compound big time unless you have patience. And so it's possible there are some people who do both, honestly. And so you could have, I do think younger people tend to be more just pure traders and the older people tend to be more pure buy and hold, but there could be some people who actually merge both and they have a little bit of trading and those single stock ETFs are going to appeal to them. They also would appeal to, like I've had somebody say, can, I, can someone put out an ETF that's S&P 500 X Tesla? Now, I, I know you would be like, why would anybody do that? But I've, heard, I've seen that. Well, now you have inverse Tesla. You could just hit buy. Like maybe Elon just goes crazy on Twitter and you're like, you know what? I don't, he's definitely going to get in trouble with the SEC. You just put that inverse Tesla in there to hedge your Tesla for like a month. There are practical utilities for there for a sane, sober investor as well. Um, but none of these are going to be that big. I have a chart that shows... Can I just interrupt you on sane and sober? <laughs> yeah. The, the, like the, just generally from a market strategy perspective, like there's, you know, if you strip away whatever it is, the top five stocks in the S&P 500, like the remainder performs at like treasuries or something. Like you actually, the reason you buy the index is because you don't know where the asymmetric return is to make sure you own the asymmetric return. Right. Like, and so the reason Tesla being denied out of the S&P 500 for so long was so terrible for end investors is because they actually missed a lot of the asymmetry. And so then giving somebody a vehicle where the thing that is kind of like, or there, there is, there is a conflation of, um, kind of 
volatility and risk in the the media financial um, landscape. And there's also, I think, a um, like taking risk is actually what the industry is being paid to do. Going back to the like large cap managers being congenitally risk averse or, or structurally risk averse. Like the reason they should be able to charge fees for their service is to take intelligent risk. And so then giving somebody an easy tool to, to then exclude out of the S&P, it's like, oh, I own the whole S&P except for this one company that the media has been saying is very risky. And so I'm going to exclude it out actually could, could totally subvert the total average returns you're trying to get with that index fund because you take out the asymmetric bet. You know? I don't disagree with that. I think you made a good point. I'm trying to put myself in the mindset of somebody who, for whatever reason, loves the S&P and just, just does not want exposure to a stock for maybe, maybe they're just, I don't know, they're an institution and they're bugged out about earnings coming up and they just want to hedge just in case there's some crazy. This is what an institution would typically use like an options for uh, just a, a quick hedge. But you're right. If you're a long term investor, you don't want to mess with any of that. Just let it ride. Don't mess with it. Keep your hands off it. Um, I don't disagree with that. I'm just saying that the other thing that people you know, need, to, need to think about is these exotic ETFs that get all the press coverage probably have 5% of all the assets. They just, I have this chart called the 95.5 phenomenon, and it has, you know, 5% of the stuff that gets, that makes up like the sort of more wild and crazy part of your portfolio is 95% of the media coverage. And the plain, boring vanilla that makes up the core gets almost no media coverage. Like VTI, which is like the most popular ETF in the past three years, like if you look at the media mentions, I mean, it's like nil, nobody cares. Because what is there to say? <laughs> But then there's stuff like uh, like the single Tesla ETF. I mean, it has like $30 million. I mean, Vanguard takes that in in like 15 minutes. <laughs> Every 15 minutes, Vanguard takes in an inverse Tesla. So I think part of why I was attracted to this book also was that I was just astounded by the vacuum cleaner flows of Vanguard because we, we discuss all these other things. And yet here's this company. We just could become a little bit immune to it, but they are astonishingly big. And they take in so much more money than everybody every year. You know, they've taken in a billion a day, every day for a decade, which is a, just a crazy thing to think about, right? And I think sometimes I try to remind myself when we get too carried away with debating whether a single stock, you know, it's like, look, this stuff's all going to be marginalized. I also personally, as an ETF analyst, I like that the tent is big. I like covering the VIX and I like covering Vanguard. Like it's, it's the experimentation here is fascinating. I mean, and it's a free market. I mean, you know, the people are going to vote with their feet. Are there occasionally somebody who probably would be better off if a single in stock ETF wasn't in front of them? Yes. But largely I think you can't like curb all of innovation and capitalism just to appeal to maybe the a minority of people who can't control themselves and are like, you know, children or whatever. So one thing we do is we have a traffic light system that's based on movie ratings. And so we have like ETFs that are like rated R, rated PG-13 and rated G. Just to help people understand, look, uh, go ahead and buy this, but it's a, it's a rated R ETF and, and here's why. So we think that would honestly solve, it would allow innovation while protecting the innocent. What makes something like a rated R ETF? What's the- If it uses leverage, if it, ro- <laughs> if it rolls futures, so if you're leverage and you roll futures, those are the rated X. That's like uh, the TVIX. Uh, there's only a couple of them. But you, you roll futures. Um, then there's a PG, PG-13, which is like really illiquid bonds, like senior loans, or um, what else is in there? An ETN that doesn't roll futures. Like some ETNs aren't that bad, but they have credit risk. There's, it's a very nuanced discussion. So we have basically 10 criteria and points. And as you tag more points, you get a worse and worse rating. So something like GLD is green light, but it does get tagged with one alternative tax treatment. So we're just trying to explain to people, trying to protect them from any surprises. So our system is an advanced warning system like the movie ratings. I think that is honestly what would solve all this, is to put this on every brokerage platform, just like movies, because you don't want Quentin Tarantino to stop making movies just because 10-year-olds exist. So you have a rating system and problem solved. Or you have 10-year-olds watching Pulp Fiction, either or. (laughs) 
Okay, okay, well, okay. So I guess I guess sometimes the rating actually attracts the ten year olds to the movie. But yeah, 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 that's, yeah a exactly. that's a whole different story. Give, yeah. give me the rated X ones. That's the. You know, I want those sure. those leverage rolling futures. Yeah, bring it all in. Eric, it seems like you had a lot of fun writing the book. I certainly had a lot of fun reading it. What do you think is the future of indexation and ETFization of the market? You know, fast forward five years. Is the is the is it is the Bogle effect? going to continue is is everything going to get compressed like are we going to end up with millions of etfs trillions of etfs like where are we going from here yeah i think etfs are where the fish are biting so you're going to find the asset management industry constantly launching there but you're going to find them launching way more in the wild and crazy space because again the the cheap bait is basically it's over so you the, like i said the bigger vanguard gets the crazier etf launches are going to get get used to it but again, I have no problem with it because, again, there's all the flows are going to cheap bait. If all the flows went to like single security ETFs, I think we'd start to have a discussion of what's going on. But they're not. I also think that you're going to find the Van Bogle effect hit the advisory business next. Advisors have – they still charge their 1%, but yet they've gotten big, and they also have a dollar fee that's grown tremendously. Now there's Betterment. Vanguard has an advisor that charges 30 to 5 basis points Schwab. And that's going to be, I think, the next big arena where the Bogle effect will play out, as well as overseas. Overseas, um, it hasn't really been as effective because brokers still get commissions from mutual funds, but that's slowly changing. So those are two of the places I see it playing out next. It's possible it goes to private equity, but I don't know. I think Vanguard's looking at private equity, but I just don't know if that's a space that's really ever going to get Bogleized. Um, but I think the advisory space is probably... That's twenty-six trillion dollars. I mean, it's bigger than mutual funds, or about, about the same size. So I think that's probably where we're going to see this play out next. In the funds world, I think again, like I said, we're going to largely see seventy percent of the money in cheap, boring vanilla, and thirty percent is going to go to stuff to decorate it with, or stuff to provide that asymmetric return that you're maybe missing in the <laughs> yeah. boring vanilla, maybe. Oh yeah, yeah, that's uh, what I mean. Yeah, yeah stuff uh, that isn't it. Yeah, stuff that you're not getting there. Yeah. On the advisor side, because I have a theory, you know, I thought that was kind of, it's an interesting idea that uh, advisors essentially charge too much because they charge based on assets and a 1% fee. And, uh, you know, advisors often ask me, they say, well, what about AI and, and robo advisors and stuff? What should we think about in terms of our business? I think advisors' primary function is actually as a psychologist. It's not as a um, you know, figuring out the exact right tax exposure for you, the individual. It's like they sh- should serve as the emergency stop button on the person who's trying to sell the funds at the wrong time or trying to buy the funds at the wrong time, right? Sure. But I think they overrate how hard that is if the person's in a cheap index fund. I think even that end client's like, yeah, you're right. What am I going to do? So I think the great resignation is is in the person too. But I agree, that's probably their best source. They also have a relationship with that person. I think planning, tax management, behavioral coaching, I agree, it's all important. The problem is you, Vanguard, what I just mentioned, that Vanguard, they'll do all that. And if you have over like $20 million, they'll do it for five basis points. I think it's harder for them to protect you from yourself is, is my theory on it. As in, I think that the behavioral psych stuff is so powerful. Um, that that's the, or at least for some subset of the population. Like if you think about whatever the fee structure is, the making that mistake is so expensive that it's worth the fee if you're prone to making the mistake of selling wrong. And I don't disagree. Wrong. That is the most, it's, you know, behavior is crucial because you have to, you, it screws up the magic of compounding. But I, like I said, I think they're going to have these big shops who have, know how to scale are going to be, able, you know, Vanguard employs 1,000 certified financial planners, a thousand. So those people will take your call and they'll probably, they all subscribe from the same playbook. They read the same stuff. They're CFPs. They're going to talk you down just like a regular advisor. What I think there's probably a middle that's disruptible. I think advisors that are real close to the ground, like they're just like real known in this Ohio town. They're probably not going to be disruptible or they're like, I heard this one guy is like all, he's like every bass fisherman uses this one advisor, probably not going to be like, there's certain niches. I just think Vanguard's going to push advisors to get niche and there's a middle that's disruptible and, but that middle is big. And I think that honestly, I would, I would prepare for it if I was an advisor. And I think a lot are, a lot are either lowering their fees, going hourly, which is pay by the hour, or they're putting in so much value 
and they keep adding value that it helps make the 1% actually like more worth it uh, over time. But that this is my theory. It's possible I'm wrong. Uh, that the advisor world just doesn't get that disrupted. But I mean, look what Betterment did. I mean, Betterment really changed the way people look at advice and how much they're willing to pay. And like I said, now that the big big asset managers are actually doing a Betterment model, again, that, that should be pretty powerful. On the private equity side, it is interesting to me that, you know, you talked about, oh, active management and how high the fees are for closet indexers. Well, I mean, management fee is one thing. Carry is an entirely different thing. And if you, you know, there's the saying like, um, you know, it's the, it's the venture capitalist that has the yacht, not his clients. Right. Uh, and, and why is that? And, and it's because that carry can be extremely lucrative to me. That seems like the big juicy thing that's out there that. The only thing is the people who buy private equity are like institutions who want like exclusivity. And I just don't know if an, if a big fancy institution with this, you know, they're, I don't know if they're going to want a Vanguard PE. I think they're going to want like, it's just a different mindset. So I think the institutional world is probably the least disruptable by the Vanguard and Bogle. I think they still subscribe to the Yale model. I do think the middle to small ones who might not need that intellectual stimulation or feeling of exclusivity, they're probably ripe to just move to Vanguard because especially they, they're not going to be able to afford the best PE, the best hedge funds. And there's a lot of them trying to be the Yale model, even though they're getting like the crappy hedge funds and private equity investments. Those are the ones that probably would do themselves a favor by just keeping it simple. Like the fireman insurance, you know, whatever, whatever the fireman fund from like this town, Yale, Harvard, I doubt they'll ever go all passive or subscribe to that model. I think they'll keep wanting exclusive PE deals and they have like the big chunk of money. I mean, that's like where those big, and institutions are huge. So I, that's why I think it's probably a little less disruptible than, say, active mutual funds from the Bogle effect, but maybe at the edges, but maybe I'm wrong. I know once Vanguard became an advisor, it forced them into everything. Because if you're an advisor and a wealth manager and some of your clients are more wealthy, they're going to want a private equity offering. They're, they're going to even want a crypto offering. So advi- Vanguard going into the advisor world is interesting because they're going to force Vanguard into all these other places that are not very Bogle-ish. But maybe that's a good thing. Did Jack Bogle have an opinion on cryptocurrencies? Do you know? Oh, yeah. He said, just stay away. I mean, basically, his thing was just it's a commodity. He did not like commodities. He wanted something with investment return behind it. He didn't want just, I'm depending on someone else paying a higher price for it. He was like from that Buffett camp of just wanting cash flow. So I don't think he hated it personally. I think he, he hated the idea of just it being a commodity. Uh, he, you know, he didn't think there was any point to that. But I do think I put in the book. I thought he was the an OG of DeFi. I do think Bogle really was a DeFi kind of dude, I, at least in ethos. I've urged the crypto people that I know to read this book, even if he wasn't into crypto, because it's so going to be so easy for some of these crypto, especially the exchanges, to just turn into what they hate, which is these big, rich Wall Street firms. They make so much money. Bogle, I think, if you just Make sure you just take care of your customers, help them, you know, if, if, throw them bones, share economies of scale. Because when you see these guys become billionaires, hiring movie stars for commercials, I don't think it really fits the populist image that they're, that they're selling. So I think I try to tell them you should read this guy was like, he was DeFi in a whole nother dimension, which you should take, you should really apply a little of that to yourself. It goes back to kind of my statement of like, what does financial innovation look like, right? It's like you provide wholesale pricing to the end consumer crypto broadly by in particularly DeFi, basically cuts out a lot of the intermediary costs and so you know conceptually it should provide essentially that you can get an identical like structured product risk exposure as an individual that otherwise you would have to be like a corporate that can go to morgan stanley's structured product desk to get that same kind of risk transformation and so then the I think there's a strong argument that the winner is, is, is kind of like a bigger platform that provides a lot of very inexpensive access to all of that kind of structured product exposure. Since the whole value proposition is you're clipping out all of the fixed cost fees of, of creating those. Yeah, but again, you look at the trading fees on Coinbase, they're, they're, pretty, they're pretty high. Um, I would say, you know, ETF tra- is one basis point. An ETF, I, I would say ETFs are going to rock crypto maybe even more than crypto rocks ETFs because I don't think crypto really realizes the Terradome 
that these ETF issuers operate. They're used to dealing in a jungle. And there you can get a if a physically backed Bitcoin ETF comes out, it's gonna trade for one basis point. It's a hell of a lot cheaper than one fifty or thirty even. Uh so that's why we're so But see, I would argue that the reason that Coinbase's customers tolerate that is because they're you know, the ones that are buying are sitting there saying, Well, the the potential price appreciation from here is whatever X. And so I don't care if I'm like paying 1% for the exposure. I just want the exposure. You would have the same feeling on the ETF. Yeah, yeah, exactly. No, you would have the same feeling on the ETF, but then you would have like much quicker price discovery of what fair value of it is. It's like, the, you know, so like at that time, well, anyway, I, I guess we will we'll probably never see because, you know, a spot ETF in the US might never be approved. Uh, there's that movie, He's Just Not That Into You. I just feel like, I always say that, he's just not into you, Gensler. <laughs> it's just, it's just, it's just all that matters is Gensler's thought. And you, know, you could analyze all this stuff. He's just not into it. It's not going to happen for a long time. Okay, well, Eric, thank you for taking the time. I really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you for writing the book. Everybody should go out and buy this book. It was really a fun read, The Bogle Effect, How John Bogle and Vanguard Turned Wall Street Inside Out and Saved Investors Trillions. Appreciate it. Thank you, Brett. Uh, it was uh, fun chatting with you. Yeah, always a pleasure. All right. Cheers. ARC believes that the information presented is accurate and was obtained from sources that ARC believes to be reliable. However, ARC does not guarantee the accuracy or completeness of any information, and such information may be subject to change without notice from ARC. Historical results are not indications of future results. Certain of the statements contained in this podcast may be statements of future expectations and other forward-looking statements that are based on ARC's current views and assumptions and involve known and unknown risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results, performance, or events to differ materially from those expressed or implied in such statements.